Um, you're going to have to click got it. Welcome YouTube and the recording to the cloud and got it one more time. All right. And um, for those of you who haven't heard, today is uh, Mark Clark Appreciation Day and we have some donuts. So grab a donut if you would like. And we are continuing on our semester long journey of hearing from alumni from the Center for Wetlands. So we have um, one of the most well known and, uh, and well respected <laughs> alumni from the Center for Wetlands, Dr. Mark Clark. Uh, Mark Clark is an associate professor in the Soil, Water, and Ecosystem Sciences Department here at UF. Um, since the well, uh, actually, 2000. One simple but brilliant trick to heat your home in 90 seconds and save thousands of dollars on your heating bill this winter. Oh, <laughs> sorry, that's my YouTube. Yeah, yeah, okay. 2004. Yeah. 2004. That's when I started my tenure position, but I came to UF in 92. Semester final seminar. Uh, so hopefully it's not our final semester. Let me get the recording going here. Uh, <laughs> I don't know who that is. Where are we going on there? I screwed them up because I have a spell here. All right. So this week is our last seminar. We're very lucky to have with us Dr. Krista Quirt. Uh, Krista where is, is, that is YouTube, right? But where is it coming from? It's a real pleasure to have it here. Thank you. If they are correct in saying the computers are going to actually take over, no matter what you do, we just going to have the board of the Let's see. Unless Megan, if that was you out there, I don't know. She says YouTube is good. All right, we're going to keep going for it. All right, so Dr. Clark has his bachelor's, no, your master's and PhD here at the center. Um, and who was your advisor? Ronnie Best. Ronnie Best. For my master's and then for my master's. All right. And so uh, Dr. Clark is not only an associate professor, but also an extension specialist, has had, I guess, now over 30 years of experience working on water, water quality, um, looking at best management practices across agricultural and other land uses, and a lot of work now on living shorelines, um, among other uh, natural or nature based solutions to environmental problems. So, Mark, the floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you, David, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, present in this um, uh, particular year of the 50th anniversary. Um, I was trying to think back, and I don't know if worthy is the right question, but representative, I guess, of my time here at this, um, this center uh, started in 1992. And so this topic of self-organization, um, you'll hear a little bit more about that, um, but then also this SEEP, and some of you may be wondering what that acronym stands for. I won't tell you right now, but you'll get it shortly. Um, but it's now, and it's depending on when you consider it starting, it's at 25 years, so about half of the 50th uh, anniversary for the, the center. So this is definitely not a data rich, it's a visual rich, um, because unfortunately we really haven't done our duty, due diligence, if you will, to um, quantitatively evaluate the progression of this particular system, even though it sits right here on campus, there was great expectations early on about having every wetland course do something out there to continue this long-term monitoring, but um, self-organization suggests that that probably wasn't the best thing to do. Let's just put it that way. Uh, so I'm just going to progress. And I think, is this a what, T? No, oh, right, yeah. Here. All right. So um, in the very, you know, without going into whole ecology class here, what shapes an ecosystem? And so in many respects, this is a stormwater retention basin. It doesn't look like most retention basins you have out there um, in the landscape. I'm sure many of you have seen them before. Um, they're integrated into many different developments now as a means to not only A, deal with stormwater, but B, increase property prices because that is now lakefront property, so we're valuable. But this particular basin built back in 1989 to 92 um, has self-organized or essentially um, organized around several different factors, which I'll go into a little more, more detail. But fundamentally, what's shaping an ecosystem is the things that are essentially the resources for it, as well as the disturbances, the genetic information that is basically able to get in and utilize those, and then ultimately time, which we all kind of refer to as succession. So this particular basin has become this. And so this story or this presentation is gonna be about how that happened. Um, how did we get from one self-organized system that was driven by certain resources and certain conditions to one that's now very different 
still the same stormwater basin, still serving that function, but providing a lot more in the sense of um, ecosystem services or um, a couple other different variables in there. So, all right, here's the groundwork. So this is the illustrious UF number eight, which means uh, the basin on campus under their stormwater management um, approach is UF number eight. We It sits here in the southwest corner of campus. We're somewhere up here. Um, but anyway, southwest corner of campus. So this basin here, everything that's um, shaded or colored um, here is about 42 acres. It's an internally drained system. There's no water that runs from this basin off campus or basically outside the basin at the surface. It's connected subsurface, but basically at the surface, it doesn't leave um, the development at present. Uh, anything that's in red is impervious and it accounts for about 40% of this 42 acre um, area, the construction, um, the main construction footprint happened between 1989 and 1992. Um, and as part of the mitigation or the um, stormwater management requirements for that, they had to increase or provide an additional half a million cubic feet of storage. And so that was placed in the bottom of the, this all kind of drains like a big cone. And so this depression right here is the result of an additional 500,000 cubic feet of storage capacity that had to be built in to minimize for flooding. And the footprint of that area is about three acres in size. Um, the geology here, the soils underneath, is right at the edge of the Hawthorne Formation. And if and you all don't know what that is, it's a thick clay layer that's also rich in phosphorus. So phosphatic materials, it underlies all of campus, a lot of the creeks cut through it, um, but it literally ends right at this edge. And so there's an old collapsed sinkhole right here. So water that comes out of this basin goes into this sinkhole and into the ground. So it never essentially leaves campus, it basically just goes into a sink and then the groundwater. And prior to this stormwater basin being constructed, there was no stormwater uh, or there's no wetlands in this basin. So from a genetic standpoint, any um, recruitment of genetic information, plants, whatnot, to get to this basin had to get there from either wind usually or animal dispersed or eventually human uh, planted. But at the time, this um, stormwater basin was constructed. There was really no natural genetic material that was available to it from or for kind of a wet uh, sort of condition. The design of the original basin was pretty conventional flat bottom, meaning these are contour lines. The, the central part of the basin had no deviation in contour. Elevation was the same. There's four main inlets. Uh, the biggest one comes from the, the park and ride lot here. There's now a, a parking garage on top of that, but it actually didn't increase the footprint at all. For the yeah. most part, it's relatively low nutrient, but very different. Uh, um, you know, road sediment runoff coming from this direction. This has now been developed into the uh, soccer field and the um, lacrosse field, I think. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's receiving now some nutrients from that direction. Um, this is kind of mixed landscape. And then the natural area teaching laboratory is on this side, but there's no drainage that comes in from that side. So we've got four different inlets. The biggest one is here from the DOT park and ride lot. Um, but the bottom line here is flat bottom basin. So that's a key factor that comes to play later. So when the water comes into the basin, it basically just finds its level point and water levels go up and down on the north end, south end, east side, west side, everything goes up and down. The same. And eventually water can raise to a height. It's gotta be about 18 inches inside here before it pops over this little berm and goes into that depression. And one concern with this original design is that under certain circumstances, you can have short circuiting where the contact of the water with anything in the basin can essentially route itself pretty quickly into the groundwater, and then if that's contaminated water, it can find its way in the ground. So um, the pre-enhancement vegetation, so this is before we did anything, which is then, again, this natural self-organization about what the hydrologic conditions we're selecting for, what vegetation could get in there, look like this. Um, and it was relatively low diversity. So we had 32 species within the footprint of the um, design water level in the basin. Um, and that was after eight years, okay? So pretty low diversity, just because what the only thing you could get in there was the um, bird and wind dispersed seeds. Um, and then the predominant species that was in here was cattail. Two species, Typhodomagensis and Typhalatifolia. Typhalatifolia was the lighter brown here, but because it's windborne and it got there probably first, it took over and established itself and then arguably either outcompeted or was just there and nothing else was there to compete. So there's a little bit of um, discussion uh, over the time as to why um, that species got in first, but regardless, 
very limited um, diversity at the time, even after eight years of recruitment, but primarily because the hydrology was only selecting for one species. So this is what it looked like, uh, 1995 to 1997. This was the landscape. It's no doubt a wetland. It's a uh, type as a native species. The uh, red-winged blackbird used to be amazing when they'd come zipping in and out of there. So in any respect, it's still a wetland, still functional, still probably very good sort of treatment system. But there was a bit of a catalyst that occurred back in about 1995, and that kind of triggered this whole idea of stormwater ecological enhancement project. And one component of it was, is there a point I got my feet? Um, one component was this National Area Teaching Laboratory. There was a lot of growth happening on campus and it was all moving to the west. And there's an area over there that is the National Area Teaching Laboratory that was um, under pressure for being developed. But there was quite a few um, uh, environmental courses or environmental classes that were using that space for teaching. And so there was a push to make that actually an outdoor classroom or an academic area. And so it was established in um, 1995. That's when it first um, found itself on the books. Um, 49 acres at the time, it's actually expanded now to 11 acres across the street, 60 acres now. Um, but in conjunction with that, Jack Putz, who is over in the botany department, um, was on the Natural Area Advisory Committee, used that area a lot. So he had a strong um, interest in that area, but he teaches a course or taught a course in ecosystems of Florida. And on their final exam, they had a question. And that question was, because many of the students that were in the exam had gone to that area, is um, what can be done to increase research and education opportunities at NATO? And a guy by the name of Mark Otto, who some of you may or may not know, um, was also at the center here um, during about this time. Um, his response was, and it was more than just three forward answer. Anyway, the bottom line was, is enhance the stormwater base. And that would be a great way to improve research and education opportunities and just generally improve um, the ecology out there just to test it. So that was kind of the idea and got planted at that point. But also in that same 1995 period, the Wetlands Club, which um, was kind of more of a social community service group at the time, was getting organized. It was really from many students that were here at the Center for Wetlands, including myself, um, and we were all indoctrinated, I will say, um, in this concept of systems thinking, self-organization, ecological engineering. Uh, we all wanted to make a difference and we wanted to change the world, right? You know, that's you come in here oftentimes very motivated to hopefully make a difference. And we were infused with these wonderful concepts, um, you know, that were, were, were just stewing around here, I guess I'll say. Um, and so this was the catalyst, the SEEP. And now we have an answer to what that SEEP stands for, Stormwater Ecological Enhancement Project. So that was the idea. So what exactly is this systems thinking and self-organization now? These are my definitions, and I'm sure they could come under great scrutiny if we had certain people in the room, but we'll work with this for now. Um, but um, bottom line, I'm just gonna read it because I, I probably couldn't recreate it, but systems thinking looks at the world in terms of the whole and recognizes that the structure, interactions, functions, processes, et cetera, of a system are not isolated, but instead interconnected at multiple levels and between natural, human, and economic systems. Bottom line, three words, it's all connected. You basically cannot isolate a piece of the pie and assume you understand the system. You have to look above, below, look at these connections. And not until you really understand it can you start to potentially um, think about manipulating it or trying to do an alternative design to get um, something out of that. Now, self-organization is kind of um, tied to the system's thinking. And the idea being is that um, self-organization is the way the system optimizes the available resources. So if you've got resources that are there, the system, including processes, the biology, everything kind of organizes around those resources. There's a whole theory behind that called maximum power. We're not gonna get into that. But the idea is that the system is self-organizing to optimize those resources and make efficient use of those things. And that can happen at all scales, human systems, natural systems. Um, and so the idea is that the two are linked. You gotta think about these interconnected pieces. And so this self-organization, um, you, if you're thinking about the design of a system, you got to think about it self-organizing around these drivers or these resources that are underlying. So if self-organization of a system maximizes available resources, that if you change the resources, the system will change. And so one way, if you've got a system you don't like or basically feel you can do better with, well, tweak the resources and it will self-organize around. <clears throat> now you can make it go in a different direction. 
there's a whole study or an area of, of engineering. You know, we think about civil and other sorts of engineering, but oops. Uh, so ecological engineering is this idea where um, you're trying to achieve this better outcome of the system by manipulating the drivers of the resources of the system. So that's kind of the, the engineering side of this manipulation. And the key here is that if these ecosystem drivers are not in, considered and taken into account, um, the desired system will either fail or you're gonna be putting a lot of additional resources in to get what you want. So not understanding the relationship or failing to actually um, uh, manipulate those drivers correctly and you have some expected outcome, you're gonna to have to go in with pesticides, let's say to eliminate the species you don't like, or you're gonna to have to go in and constantly add more energy to try to force the system in a direction it doesn't wanna go because it's gonna win all the time. As long as you don't, once you, unless you have enough resources to combat it, so to speak. <clears throat> all right. Is that, you know, trigger happy or what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, so with this, all these things in mind, these are the things that are going on in the wetlands club at the time. They've now got a challenge to see what could be done with this basin. Um, so the wetlands club slash the seep, seep objectives um, or can this basin, this stormwater retention basin that's essentially self-organizing under one resource availability, um, can it be redirected to improve species richness, improve water quality, um, improve education and research opportunities, which was again, the answer to that or the question that was posed originally, and then ultimately, improve aesthetics, and I'll get to let you all answer that one at the end, because that's for each of us to choose. So what was done to this basin to change the driver process? Okay, so here's our original basin, flat bottom once again, and hydrology, especially in a wetland, is the primary driver of everything. So species are selected for or removed um, based on their tolerance to inundation and flooding. So if you have a single hydrologic regime, you will have basically a short list of species that can tolerate and optimize that particular regime. If, however, you diversify that hydrology, you will inherently start selecting for a greater diversity of plant species. Um, and so here was our original flow. Here's our post design. Okay, so the three primary pieces of this design. Number one, when you have a stormwater retention basin or when you have your stormwater design, you design around a design storm. Okay, that's usually, it could be a 24 hour, 25 year um, event. It could be a hundred year event for a certain duration of time, but there's a certain volume of water that's coming off the landscape that because you've modified the um, conditions in the landscape, that water is gonna usually come off faster and at a greater volume. And your stormwater retention basin has to mitigate that for that so that anything downstream is not gonna be impacted. So that's where we came up with that 500,000 um, uh, cubic feet of additional storage needs. The issue, however, is that the basin's design is around, in this case, the 100-year storm event. So you only have 1% probability, statistically, for that occurring in any one year. So the footprint of this is really not designed to optimize any annual or biannual or whatever event. It's for the 100-year event. So it has to handle that capacity, but maybe there's other designs that could be built in. So one thing that we did is partition the basin into two cells instead of one. About 80%, almost 90% of the water first comes into the northern end of the basin, and only about 10% comes into the southern end of the basin. So now what we're doing is we're phasing the way water moves through the basin. So if we partition this, not as a single cell, but into two cells, majority of our water lands here, and then we can let it flow out of this area and into the rest of the area. So now we have two different zones, one of which is receiving the water first, and then we can let it move into the other part of the basin. So we're changing... Even though the elevation is the same on either side of the berm, the hydrology is different on one side versus the other because we can phase how it goes through. The next was just to overall increase topographic relief in the basin, make it more complex to the flat. We now have a berm that's got higher elevation. To fill the berm or to get filled for the berm, we actually created a deeper area. So now we've got lower topography and higher topography. And then we actually, the last part was to route water through the basin because if we're trying to improve water quality, we need to influence the way water gets from here to here. And we want to maximize the amount of soil and vegetation that that comes in contact with so we can't get a short circuit. Now that water has to find its way basically all the way around a much more circuitous route. So those were the general designs and we did that just by manipulating the, the topography. 
internal to the basin. <laughs> That's very um, and so um, we actually didn't bring any new fill in. We just reorganized the fill internally. And that was important because if we lost any of that 500,000 cubic feet of storage, we had a problem with our original permit. So in fact, we actually exported some material. Okay, so that was what the basin looked like after our redesign. Um, <clears throat> again, here's the core bay, or we call it core bay. 80%, 85% of the water comes in here. And you'll see in a second there's a weir here, but then water can bleed down through. It first fills the pond. Once it fills the pond, eventually it'll back out to this um, uh, um, collapse sink. <clears throat> All right, so here's our weir. We had the ability to modify this if we needed to. We designed it so that we could have all sorts of fancy monitoring. We didn't do anything <laughs> there. It still works. But the idea is that the water can now, instead of equalizing in the basin within hours during a storm, water gets stored in the forebay and then it takes about three days to now move and equalize from the forebay into the rest of the basin. Meanwhile, it's moving and creating a flow inside the basin for those three days, at least portions of the basin. Okay, and just to prove the point, um, here's just, we did do this much. Um, we've got some um, just surface water monitoring um, in the forebay, um, in the, let's see, marsh or basically the swamp that's just downstream from that, in the pond down here, and then ultimately over here, and that's groundwater for the most part. Um, but just the fact that these are different shapes says their hydro pattern or hydro period um, characteristics are different, and that was the goal, is to try to partition how the water moved in the basin so that we get these differences or more complex or um, um, diverse hydrologic regimes, <clears throat> because that's our primary driver that becomes the selection tool for vegetation um, that's in the system, plus other biochemical processes. All right, so now that we're creating all this uh, diversity in hydrology, we want to also provide or increase the diversity of species to utilize that. Because if we still only have 32 species in there, they may move around a little bit, a lot more opportunities for species to find their, or to establish themselves in that basin, but they got to get there, right? So what we did is this was the jumpstart in genetic material. So based on the hydrologic characteristics of the basin, we did some very primitive modeling, you would probably be like, what are they doing? Yeah. <laughs> but fundamentally, we looked at hydro period and we looked at the comparison between the hydro period we expected in the um, recontour design with native communities, wetland communities, and said, okay, here's a species list that could be planted here, 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 here. And so that's what we did is we came up with a species list for each of those. Um, and what we ended up with then, um, so the recontouring happened in 1998. The planting occurred in 1999, but there was a survey done prior to any disturbance or any of our um, interventions. So 32 species that we started with in 1997, and in 1999, we planted 53 species. But one of the keys here was that what we were trying to do is not replant the basin. Really what we wanted to do is introduce genetic information. So a lot of these species were only planted maybe three to five individuals. And so the idea is you get the genetic information in there. If that species survived, meaning it was good enough, and it started to reproduce. Now its genetics would move into the basin and find wherever they had the right spot. Our guess was primitive. Its selection would be pretty much optimal for whatever conditions it had. Um, so that was primarily the woody species. We had herbaceous in there. But the one species that we did put a lot in was bare root cypress seedlings. And we planted about 700. We have by 50 in there now. So most of them did not make it, but that doesn't mean they don't still have a strong imprint out there. Um, <clears throat> and the other surprise, and this was, you could argue, was a self-organizing scenario is we thought we were only getting pond cypress, but we actually ended up getting the plant material from um, the uh, Andrews Nursery, which is the Florida Department of Forestry. Um, and they donated them. They're not allowed to do that, but they said, just back your truck up, we'll throw some bags in. <laughs> so we got, there's uh, three bags, one of which though was actually um, bald cypress. So we ended up with a mix. So an inch, well, never mind, that's another story. Um, okay, so here's what happened then after the recontouring. So we had the pre existing vegetation, we had a plan, we took about 12 months to figure out how to get it funded, get it permitted, and then it literally only took three days to do the implementation of the earth moving and scrape the theory and whatnot. We did our best to retain microtopography and minimize the compaction because unlike many sites that a big earth moving equipment would be running around on, we weren't building a building or a road, we're trying to plant in that. So we're trying to minimize that compaction. 
But one of the key um, experiments, if you will, um, that was underway here was that we did not remove all the cattails. If you remember, 95% of the basin was cattail dominated just because that was what was there. When we did the recontouring, we disturbed obviously where the excavation occurred here. There was a haul road that moved material back and forth to basically place it on the berms, a little disturbance here. But anything that's left brown here did not get cut. You can see there's a lot of green left in there. So cattails still dominated the basin, or at least they were greater than 50%. <laughs> and that became a big question. Over time, what's gonna happen? The cattails, which had the advantage before and it competitively advantageous, but they're going to take everything over. So even our new plantings would just be consumed. Or would now that they have to compete in hydrology, all sorts of other variables, would they actually start taking and um, receding in their dominance in the system? So that was a kind of experiment underway. Okay, the third piece of our puzzle then was time. And so you're going to get a set of images here, and these are just the visual transformations or the successions of the basin from a couple different perspectives. Um, so um, parking garage, this was a great vantage point up until about 2008. Um, so here's time, um, and you're going to get a, a, oops, a date up here in the upper right. Okay, sir. Um, so in the upper right corner, you'll have the date when the photo was taken. So this would have been um, one year after the planting or two years after the recontouring. Um, you can kind of see parts of the pieces here. There's, there's this, um, there's the pond area here. There's a divergent berm here. There's another berm here. It's the four bay berm. The one species that took off really quickly was Myrica cerifera. Um, it's a nitrogen fixer, a lot of phosphorus in the soil. It was the biggest thing out here for about five years. Now you can't hardly find it because it's now under an underscore canopy of other species. Okay, that's 2000, 2002. It's these little bit. Um, kind of russet color in here is uh, cypress. This is like roughly the same time of year. But notice all the cattail. Still lots of cattail through the year. 2007, um, this pine tree got too big. And so stopped shooting from the roof. Oh. Okay, so back on the ground, this is from the north end, kind of a little closer, 98. That's just before the, the um, recontouring. You see the heavy equipment over there right after the recontouring. So that's the where the weir is, that little opening, this was the hall road that moved material back and forth. Let's see all the cattail. <clears throat> 2002, seven, another bad vantage point after 2014. That's, so I took these Monday, not the best day to shoot, but either way, it's as close as it was yesterday, but oops. Okay, so here's 1997. Um, so that was roughly when we did our, our survey for the 32 species. This is after the contouring. These are slides, by the way. That's why they're four pictures. <laughs> you had to go back to slides back then. Okay, 2000, 2002, 7, then Monday. I think this is, this is the last one. So this is actually the diversion berm um, on the southern side. Um, but you can see where the cattails are. We actually are doing planting in pretty high water. Um, but you'll see this image again in a while. There's O2. Herbaceous wise, we planted some species, but a lot of the grasses and all, they were all um, pretty much windborne or brought in just by. Um, they, there are successional fields off to the, um, in this case, off to the left. And with higher elevation within the basin now, these became recruitment sites. So these were brought in like windborne, but they didn't have to come from outside the basin. They were in there but because technically this isn't really a wetland. This piece, this is more of a um, you know, zero sort of a, a landscape. All right, 07, 14, and then Monday. Okay, so you got some mental time series there, but based on what we had talked about back in the day, um, we had certain expectations and we wanted to verify those. And so part of what I was doing out there on Monday is, well, let's double check to see if it was working or not. So one of our ideas was in planting our limited number of individuals, but the intent being to introduce genetic information, how successful was that? Were we seeing recruitment within the basin? And the answer is yes. Um, so all these are little saplings. They're probably about three years old right now. It's Fractionus Carolina. Um, and this plant right here was one that was planted. So we planted this one. I can't say that this specifically came from that tree, but there was only five of these um, Fractionus Carolina plants planted in the basin. So odds are that indeed this is, these seedlings are coming from, maybe not that one, but at least one of the five. 
Cypress trees, we planted no cypress trees on this side of the pond, on this side of the basin. They're all, they were all planted up here, but we've got one, two, and there's actually a third one back there. And they kind of pop up in different places. They seem to be an age class that's about six or seven years old. And I'm not exactly sure what happened during that time, but they seem to now be popping up in different parts of the basin. In some respects, the distribution of the fractionists is becoming a little problematic. Because one driver we don't have in the system, especially if we want to maintain some of it as a marsh, is fire. And so in the absence of fire, we will have self-organization and it will become pretty much a hardwood swamp and probably dominated by that fractions. So we may go into a clippers as an alternative means to take care of that one. But all right, another anticipated outcome. We definitely had this dynamic movement of certain species along the edges. We knew this was going to happen. We weren't sure how um, dynamic or dramatic it was going to be. Um, between like the early, pretty much the, the, the 2000s, not up until about 2013, we were in a bit of a drier period. We definitely had wet periods. Obviously, 2004 was a pretty wet period. We had a couple of hurricanes running through here. But overall, it was relatively dry. And pines tended to encroach on the edges of this uh, wetland area. So this one actually was out there um, in a dying form. But there's a couple of stumps right in here that got taken out after Hurricane Irma. Kind of brought water in and, and kept water high for a while, which it did in many natural landscapes too. Um, and so we see this dynamic edge of certain species that kind of creep in when it's dry and they're drier species, but then they get knocked out when it's on the wetter side. And same too with the herbaceous cover on the edges. Um, we also now are seeing quite a bit of woody debris, which is usually a good signature of a kind of an older growth or a later successional stage because that's providing a whole different suite of community um, substrate for certain species. What we didn't expect is that a lot of this debris came from species that we, um, I, that was premature, hold that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another anticipated outcomes, of course, was that these various different zones in here, which we have these hydrologic um, diversity with intent and then planted to try to take advantage of that indeed did quite well. Um, we have marsh areas that, if you remember, um, this was actually, well, you don't remember, but uh, this was dominated by typha. It's not, there's no typha in here anymore. And we didn't plant anything here. So it's uh, where most of our planting of herbaceous species was, was in the, um, the treatment zones. So now what we have out through here is mostly Sagittary Lancifolia, Latifolia, Fundigera cordata. There's a uh, polygon species, um, um, Panicum. There's a lot of herbaceous community out here, but there's no typha in this particular area. We've got our pond or deeper water habitat. We've got our um, cypress slough or our swamp area um, that came in there. Again, these cypress trees were planted as one-year-old bare root seedlings. They were this big. Now they're over 50 feet tall. And some of them, there's one out there. I don't know what's going on. It's huge. I'm not sure what uh, tapped into the sewage main or something. Um, all right. So when you have a self-organizing system, you get surprises because unless you have resources or the desire to control these things, you essentially let them happen. And that's really almost meant to be because something about that species or something about that process is optimizing the conditions. It's got an advantage and so it should ultimately be promoted. Otherwise you're gonna spend or invest energy. Now we do intervene periodically and remove willow from the treatment marsh area because the willow is not as good at treatment as the marsh species, but the willow comes in and overtops. And so we do intervene there, even though self-organization says willow would be the dominant species. But one species we did not plant and we had no anticipation about was pines. And so on the berms, um, so this is actually the diversion berm, or not the diversion berm, but the berm that partitions the four bay from the rest of the basin. And then this is the diversion berm, which is this berm right here. So we planted hardwood species, some cypress trees on there, but the dominant canopy now, and by all means, the basal area is pine. And we had no anticipation that pine was going to dominate, but live and learn, all of these are pine. And those seeds are easily distributed when that soil was bare, just like that, um, it colonized very quickly. So um, the dominant biomass out there is pine, not the we planted, at least in the sense of woody species. Um, and that's generating most of the woody um, material at this point. We also had our grand, kind of grand experiment here, which was regard to cattails. And the question was, what was going to happen? Was the cattail going to come in and dominate, or was the cattail going to recede? And it's you're hard pressed really to find much cattail out there now. Um, 
And one little clump here, this is behind this diversion burn ponds on the other side, a little clump here, it's producing plenty of seed. You know, one catkin, you know, I, I did a torment some students one time, and we estimated about 100,000 seeds per catkin. So only one catkin um, can find its way to, you know, and probably how it got dominated in the system already. So it's not like it's not got the potential, it's something that's not being selected for. We actually have an interpretive sign out there that if you could read this sign, it would say cattail marsh. Because at the time the sign was posted, that was a cattail marsh. No more cattail. We got rid of the sign now. <laughs> um, and another little twist, which was even a bigger surprise, is there was a student that was working with Ramesh Reddy at the time looking at vivipary in um, uh, sawgrass for an Everglades project. She had 30 plants, uh, sawgrass plants, that she had left over. She was like, what can we do with them? I was like, well, you want to put them in seat, see what happens? Mm -hmm. So the challenge was, like, let's see what happens when we plant them right in the middle of a cattail marsh. Because this was 19, this would have been, no, 2002 or three. So this right here was still all cattail. And so she went and put her 30 plants in there, and we, like, forgot about them. We thought for sure they were gone. Well, the species that's there right now, this is not cattail. This is cattail. This is not cattail. This is sawgrass. Sawgrass won, actually, in the end. And I think the mechanism, because a lot of times, if you know anything about the Everglades, the reason the cattail is primarily invading and outcompetes the sawgrass there is because of added phosphorus or elevated phosphorus level. And the um, cattail utilizes that and grows rapidly. The whole strategy behind sawgrass is to be conservative of phosphorus, does great under low phosphorus, but essentially gets outcompeted under high phosphorus. The soils here, if you remember, are full of phosphorus. So phosphorus is not the issue. So I think if anything, the cattail has the advantage, but under drought conditions, that cattail cannot handle it. This is clay soil, it's not organic soil. When it gets dry in the soil, it's dry. It's not like an organic sponge that still retains quite a bit of moisture. And so whenever we've had a drought, the cattail has continually kind of receded, whereas other species, including the um, sawgrass, which does better under drought, I'm not saying it likes the drought, I'm just saying it does better, um, seems to then take the advantage and then it's really hard for the cattail to get back in there. Um, so that is a hypothesis more than anything. But either way, what we see now is like less than probably 5%, more like 1% cattail in the system. Another unexpected outcome, and again, we're thinking about the drivers from the bottom, right? This is a whole difference in kind of the mental mindset. If you're a wildlife ecologist, you think everything's driven from the top down. If you're you know, a soil scientist or a water person, do you think it's all from the bottom up? So we're thinking bottom up. Well, guess what? Um, we have some interesting species that show up on a regular basis. A lot of our wading birds utilize that area quite a bit. But this is a yellow cardinal, and that probably brought in more birders than any other activity that we had. But anyway, kind of novel, that's one of our secret trees that's hanging out in. But we've also had three that I know, potentially four that I could never verify, um, nesting gators out there. And that's, to me, kind of certification that um, they must, must have sufficient habitat. Of course, that doesn't jive necessarily with the university's policies about interaction with alligators and whatnot. But regardless, we definitely have a lot more wildlife than we had anticipated. But again, that's probably a, you know, a, a higher trophic state uh, verification from a self-organization standpoint that something must be going right. Now, what also helped that public access is a public boardwalk that was put in there in 2008. Um, credit goes to the students. You all want some of your fees basically go into a fund called the Capital Improvement Trust Fund. And some of that money was remobilized. The students actually decided that they wanted to have a champion project and they decided it would be the seat and a boardwalk um, that goes through seat now. So you can see it, the orientation over there put from the top goes back and forth across the the berm in several spots, we've got um, interpretive signs, um, nice boardwalk, expensive boardwalk. Actually, it's probably cheap nowadays. Um, plus, this got tied into the Florida Natural Museum of Natural History once it moved over there. So definitely um, a lot of directed individuals go that direction. But just a note about this design, um, it's a wetland. It goes up and down. It's a stormwater basin. We had two choices. Either we could elevate the boardwalk deck so that um, we never flooded, but because of the dynamics nature of the, the uh, hydrology, we would have to be above the 30 inch threshold at which uh, for um, ADA compliance, basically, if you're above 30 inches, you have to have railing. Okay, so you notice this section of the boardwalk this way has this railing, but we didn't want that because we didn't feel it was providing the intimate kind of interaction, which is kind of cool, especially when the water is high. 
So we actually have designed this or planned this to be underwater periodically for some of the basins. So about three weeks out of the year, the red, much of this boardwalk will be underwater and essentially unusable. But this section would have meant the boardwalk, because it's a lower in elevation, would have been underwater for like two months out of the year. And so <laughs> you may show up sometime. I don't recommend walking on it when it's wet. It's fun, but um, it's usually blocked off. But it is by design that that does go underwater periodically. All right, so yeah, ten minutes. Is all right, I can do it. Can I actually do it for one? Second. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so we had these objectives, right? The club and the the seat had objectives early on as to whether or not um, we could achieve certain things. And again, somewhat limited data, but there have been periodic um, um, measurements and whatnot. So, what about species richness? So, from a vegetative standpoint, the count nineteen ninety seven before anything happened was thirty two. In nineteen ninety nine, we added fifty three species, so that brought it up to eighty five. But after 1999, at least I don't know any new plantings that occurred. So any increases in numbers were either because we probably had certain seedlings in the pots that we weren't keeping track of, and so they were introduced, or because of an increased um, structure or whatnot, bird species were now utilizing it, bringing in seeds, windborne things, other potential processes. But a survey in 2004, 120 species total, so 88 new since the pre um, and then in 2014, we did another survey, 168 now. And so basically there's 51 species that showed up that we didn't plant or weren't there in the beginning. And so I have credited them to self-organization, but I don't know for sure. It might've been some other intervention. Maybe somebody was, you know, I was thinking eating something, but what would they eat that's a wetland plant or potentially do yeah. it? Um, so bottom line though, because of the intervention, we've quadrupled plus the number of species in that footprint of land. Um, wildlife, 54 birds, uh, five mammals, 13 herpetofauna, five fish, and unknown numbers of insects. So um, entomology, I suppose I could probably figure that out. Um, they use this area a lot for um, uh, collecting specimens. Uh, water quality improvements, we've done some surveys, nothing really quantitative, but there's some general um, trends that we've seen. We didn't have a whole lot of data pre, so it's kind of hard to say how much we improved, but we see within the basin certain um, differences here, but certainly total suspended solids um, uh, are higher at the inlets, that's the no-brainer. But what you can see is that the uh, water quality in the forebay, this area here, is always a lot more turbid than anything in the rest of the basin. And so what we've done is because of the, you know, the, the, the whole basin's not being used um, during, most storms. And so what we've created is a retention basin within a retention basin, if you will. So we have pre-settling come here, and then it moves into the rest of the basin, which we don't really think about as the stormwater basin. We think about it more as the treatment system or more about a kind of a natural system. Um, and definitely the water that goes through that weir is much, much lower in turbidity than um, what's coming out of the pipes. Um, nitrogen is significantly lower south of the floor bay during the wet season. However, during the dry season or as it's wetting up, we actually get a pretty good pulse of nitrogen out because there's organic matter that's accumulating in the sediment but during the dry phase. A lot of that's decomposing. It's got a, kind of a rich nitrogen pulse once it refloods. But if the reflooding just pushes it from here into the pond area, then it's reassimilated before it leaves. If it's a big event in the spring, then it kind of will push it all the way through and let it go down. Phosphorus levels are low pretty much regardless of whether dry. And then, um, if you're into the literature at all with regards to, to um, stormwater retention systems, they're really supposed to be an 80% contaminant load reduction. So the loading that comes from the landscape is supposed to be treated to a level of 80% for any contaminant of concern so that what leaves the basin um, will not be detrimental. And that's um, a difficult one to kind of resolve if you're actually looking at concentration versus loads. But from the standpoint of the most um, detention basins, they don't really meet the criteria for nitrogen or phosphorus. This is a retention basin. So technically anything that goes in the ground is treated. Yeah. But if we measured here, the concentrations leaving, we achieve between 60 and 80%, which is higher than most um, um, yeah. stormwater basins. So basically that, that huge amount of additional biological activity is making a big difference in the um, treatment potential. There was one, there's actually been two soil surveys, but one was done in 2003, this was 07, nothing since. But what it does start to show is that, and we know that basically there are heavy metals that come in with stormwater 
sediments, mostly they're bound to the sediments. The sediments settle pretty quickly in the system. But before the forebay was placed, um, that had a chance to really distribute more broadly. What we see now is most of the, um, so pink is basically, or red is gonna be where your higher concentrations are. Most of these are getting trapped within the forebay and really not distributing south of the forebay. And that's kind of important because sooner or later, we will have to go in and excavate a portion of the basin because of sudden accretion and start to lose volume. Um, and so a certain amount of this can be removed, but the targeting would probably be just the four bay instead of the whole basin. And if you look at the organic matter content, it's much higher in this four bay area, and that's where a lot of your nutrients are getting bound up or your metals are getting bound up. And so again, the idea is that if we're constraining that to only a portion of the basin, not the whole basin, if you do have to intervene by removing something, um, you basically might be able to do that in a third of the basin without stirring the whole thing, which is oftentimes the case. So that actually was a master's thesis that was looking at that. So from an education standpoint, uh, lots of opportunities, lots of classes use this area, but we have also a lot of public interaction now. There's, um, there's kiosks, there's um, you know, student groups, that's the weapons club working with the local school out there, and all sorts of fun things to do. Um, maybe some of your classes have actually been out there. And aesthetics, again, I said that's your call because um, the aesthetics in the eye of the beholder, and so therefore, um, I'll let you decide on that one. And that's not my photo, so that does a lot to benefit aesthetics. Um, and with that, I will then just acknowledge some key players in this whole process. Um, Tom Walker was the uh, chair of the National Area Advisory Committee at the time we were implementing that, this project. And so he was really instrumental because we were a bunch of students. We didn't know the bureaucracy of campus, let alone the fact that we couldn't really build the stormwater or modify the stormwater retention base, and that had to be you know, physical plant division. And so it got really you know, big quickly. We didn't know how to raise money. So either he was very instrumental um, and has been for the National Area um, uh, um, Teaching Lab from the beginning. Obviously, the Wetlands Club, they were the initiators of this project, but they've also been the maintainers and the managers and the repairers of the boardwalk throughout. So it doesn't exist without them in major um, respect. Uh, Natural Area Advisory Committees pretty much relinquishes oversight of this area to us, which is huge from the standpoint of us being able to continue implementing. One of the challenges we have is we do have some exotic species in here. We, as part of our self-organization, don't want to manage it. Luckily, because we're a closed basin, we are um, kind of getting away from it, getting away with it because it's not a potential impact downstream. But my gut feeling is if we start trying to spray out certain species, we'll have a bare spot and there will be no functionality of that bare spot and we will never really get ahead of that curve. What we see now is a lot of times these exotic species are moving around internal basin, but they are not like taking more area. In fact, we've got one that's pretty aggressive, torpedo grass, and it was in one area last year and it's gone from that area. It's moved into another area. So it's moving around. It's not like it's being extirpated from the system, but it's also not seemingly out competing other species that are in there. Funding for the seat, um, about $60,000 was raised among several colleges. Um, um, and we actually got a little money out of the water management district. The, as I mentioned before, the boardwalk fee or very boardwalk basically cost $100,000, which um, um, was a big chunk, but either way it was a lot of most people keep their feet dry. But then of course the, the mindset for all of this came from um, H.D. Odo, Mark Brown, Clay Montague and Brian Best at the time. So none of this would have happened if it wasn't for the scenario and really great um, inspirations that came before. So I have one last slide. This just puts the time factor in my mind. That's my daughter. She was three at the time. And to the best of my ability, I've tried to keep track of that plant. And I think this is the plant. All right, go so, stand with that, Mark. I sent it to a little bit. Today. All right, there you go. Oh, oh So anyway, time marches on for all of us. I had hair. I look at that. All right, any questions? All right, thanks. I could, yes. All right, so questions from the crowd. What do you have for Dr. Clark? If yeah. you had to remove some of that sediment that's got metals in it, what can you do with it? Well, my understanding is, you know, all of it's kind of pre-slated for a class three landfill, but I believe, and 
I don't know how many municipalities do this, but I think you could probably test it and actually determine what level of possible concern there is in it and maybe make an argument that it doesn't have to get diverted there. But my understanding is like all street sweepings, anything that's tied to stormwater um, uh, runoff is pretty much like predetermined to be contaminated and therefore it has to be disposed of. Well, all the students in core, you can tell what is the test that you would run on that soil to decide where whether it was hazardous waste or not. The SVLV, Sunday precipitation leaching procedure, see if anything leaches off of it. I don't know the answer. SPLP. Okay, all right. Anyway, yeah. We'll get 10,000 in there, right? You take that course too, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, I mean, I think one of the challenges there is if it's based on concentration, dig a little deeper, dilute it a little bit, then maybe you can use it for somewhere else. But, you know, I don't. Um, I think it's pre-slated to pretty much be disposed of in a in a you know hazardous built area. Yeah. yeah. What kind of crimes? So I believe they're all loblolly. They don't look like slash to me. And um, there's no long leaf. It was interesting because on the southern edge of the pond, we didn't scrape that area, but there was a lot of um, exposed soil and there was a lot of um um, Longleaf that recruited in there, but they didn't make it past about five or six years. And I, I think it was just a phase that it went through because we didn't plant anything. It just somehow was there. Mm -hmm. But we haven't seen any longleaf or um, slash pine out in the footprint. And it's multi-class years, so they're still recruiting. It wasn't just a one-off on the early, you know, exposure of all that, that sediment. But it's um, yeah, because lo um, loblolies are mostly on the edges as well. So yeah. So how can the students get involved with the wetlands club? What's what's going on with wetlands club at the moment? It's a good question because we had a really good kickoff meeting. I don't know what they're doing right now. <laughs> okay. So I would say get a hold of me. I didn't put my uh, number in there. Um, Rebecca Warwick is the president of the club right now, but I would say contact me. And then meantime, before next week, we yeah. don't meet until we'll meet at twenty eight, twenty nine. Yeah, I will. Figure out what the club's going to do. So, uh, Mark, you have a I'm question? I'm going to talk to the advisor, by the way, so I should know. I do. Mark Brown, go ahead. Hey, Mark, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Good. Um, <laughs> I was wondering about that master's thesis. Did she look at um, organic matter accumulation rate or sediment accumulation rate? And, and if so, how long before you think you need to um, dredge that before Bay out? Yeah, so the, really the only rate would be a comparison um, between the area that was scraped and the area that was non-scraped because she does have a thickness of that organic matter layer. And so she would know when it initiated either, you know, pretty much 1989 when the basin was first dug or 1998 when it was recontoured. But um, there's not been any assessment of organic matter thickness since then. So um, I guess the answer is, I don't know. I think we could make a projection from that data. She did not do that, um, but I'd be a little weary of using that same projection after only, what, five? Well, so my student years. Sasha went back in 2021 and two and took, I don't know if she did the whole uh, depth that she did the okay. percent carbon. Okay. So we can compare to the 28th study, the 2008 study. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So there, so there may be some studies that have been done that we could put that together. I've always been a little bit skeptical of thinking how much that affects the storage because there's a lot of porosity in organic matter. Like and, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I think that, um, you know, the plant, biomass may actually be greater than or somewhat, I don't know, maybe not greater than, but I always calculate or figured about five to 10% of the area being displaced by trunk biomass and stem biomass. But, you know, a lot of times organic matter can be, you know, still 70 to 80% porous. Mm -hmm. So the volume displacement may not be as great as the depth of soil accumulation might suggest, but, but I think we might be able to look at that. That's a good question, Mark. Yeah, I'm just wondering if it's possible to, uh, you know, estimate it. Yeah. All right. So I have to go with you. So this was uh, during COVID and it was the boardwalk was, you know, quote unquote closed. But we went out anyway and we called this the, yeah, the flooded boardwalk. We go out there whenever. This is yeah, about two years ago. But they, they've been definitely like um, walking when it's flooded. So. 
they're they were little yeah. and there were all sorts of um things to play with as long as don't step off the boardwalk that was the thing the yeah uh, <laughs> we there's Bobby, Bobby and we awesome. found these little frogs. Oh, yeah, awesome. it's very serious. So anyway, you guys should go out and check it out. It's yeah, beautiful sure. out there. Yep. Yeah, All right. Really I will nice. stop sharing that. Um, very cool. Yeah, he always got to empty yeah, the out at the end. It was June 2001. Yeah, it was really wet out there. We overtopped our boots and got our feet wet. Right <laughs> All right. So thank you, folks. Another round of applause for Dr. Clark. Which is uh, now officially November 15th. All right. All right. So we don't have seminar next week. It's uh, Thanksgiving week. Yeah, we don't have. Yeah. And the following week, we have Charles Lane from USCPA, another alumni, and he will be presenting virtually, but we'll be in the room. So you can attend on Zoom or live. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, YouTube. And we will see you all in two weeks.